I asked Dr. Rasa to talk about, you know, transpetrosal pressure in the nasal approaches. And I think this is a very interesting topic. So please, Sam, go ahead. Well, Juan, thank you very much for uh, including me in this session. It truly really is an honor. It's also an honor to be included with all the other speakers from, you know, I've learned so much from you guys over the years with regards to surgical decision making. Uh, so, you know, I was asked to sort of tackle the discussion of endoscopic versus uh, transpetrosal approaches. And there's going to be some overlap with uh, Paul's talk earlier, but I'm mainly going to focus on posterior petrosal and combined petrosal approaches. And I think uh, this discussion is really relevant to the management of petroclival pathology. And, you know, this is certainly an interesting area, not only with regards to surgical technique and anatomy, but also the, the wide variety of pathology that you see in this area. You know, on one hand, you can see extradural benign pathologies such as cholesterol granulomas and cholesteatomas, but also malignancies such as chordomas and chondrosarcomas. And to the point that was made earlier is that understanding the diagnosis is really a key factor in terms of designing a surgical strategy. For example, for a cholesterol granuloma where the goal is really to marsupialize the cyst, you really don't need an extensive and wide skull-based approach, really something that's tailored. On the other hand, for a chordoma and chondrosarcoma, the goals are very different. And just given the, the nature and focus of my practice, I was mainly going to use the, these bony sarcomas as an example in terms of selecting a surgical strategy. Really, the, the goals of surgery here are very clear, is to perform a wide and anatomic resection of the primary bony compartment of the tumor, and then secondarily resect any additional extensions of the tumor into adjacent bony and soft tissue compartments in an anatomic fashion. So for example, for a petroclival chondrosarcoma like this, really what should be resected is the mid and low clivus in addition to the petrous portion of the temporal bone, all up to anatomic landmarks, skeletonizing the carotid artery, exposing the posterior fossa dura, and then resecting the dura widely and any subdural disease extension. So surgery consists of much more than an intralesional curatage, but really a wide resection of all the bone. And certainly we know that this has a significant impact on progression-free survival and overall survival when we look at chondrosarcs, chordomas, and high-grade osteosarcomas in our practice. And certainly the higher-grade malignancy, uh, the, the stakes are much higher. And so that really sets the stage in terms of what is the goal of surgery. Now, from the anatomic perspective in this area, you know, the petroclival synchondrosis, of course, represents that anatomic boundary between the mid-clivus and the petrous portion of the temporal bone, which has, of course, an apex and a base. And the synchondrosis extends from the inferior aspect of foramen lacerum down to the medial aspect of the jugular foramen. And I think this uh, cadaver uh, illustration on the right side here really highlights some of the surgical challenges of accessing this region with the spectrum of open and endoscopic approaches. With a uh, posterior transpetrosal approach, you have to deal with the facial nerve. And despite transposing that, you still have the jugular foramen and the lower cranial nerves that limit your access to the inferior aspect of the synchondrosis and the low clivus. With an anterior petrosal approach, you have great access to the petrous apex and the upper two thirds of the synchondrosis, but again, limited access to disease medial to the jugular foramen and the low clivus. With a midline endoscopic transclival approach, you can certainly access this area with angled instruments and angled endoscopes uh, to do an intralesional curatage, but the ability to drill out all this bone is rather limited and also to safely dissect these lower cranial nerves out. And I think, you know, in addition to the uh, deep center location, the synchondrosis within the skull base, there are also some other anatomic factors to consider. As I mentioned, a lot of these tumors can spread into adjacent compartments. So when we looked at, for example, our petroclival chondrosarcomas, you know, a third of these patients have disease extension to the infratemporal fossa. Despite their extradural origin, half of these patients have disease extension to the subdural space, and half of these patients have disease extension to the cavernous sinus. And it's important to understand this because with whatever surgical strategy you pick, each one of these compartments has to be accessed ideally with that surgical strategy to perform a meaningful resection. And uh, you know, the highlight, again, the, the challenges of managing pathology in this area, when we looked at our experience with chondrosarcomas at all skull-based sites, and you look at outcomes by site of origin, uh, primarily with the use of open approaches, uh, those chondrosarcomas arising at the petroclival synchondrosis have traditionally have had the poorest outcomes with regards to extent of resection, neurologic function, and sur surgical complications. And this is with the use of either anterior petrosal, posterior transpetrosal, or combined petrosal approaches. And I think this is consistent with what has been reported in the literature with the use of open approaches. And so the, clearly this is an area if, where there has been need for improvement. 
And I think this is where adding the, uh, the endoscopic transpterygoid approach, as was described by Paul earlier, has really helped uh, improve outcomes when you include this as part of your toolbox. And the, the philosophy here is really by uh, resecting the medial and lateral pterygoid plates, performing a medial infratemporal fossa dissection, skeletonizing the carotid and dissecting the eustachian tube, you really have direct access to this area to really drill out this bone, drill out and resect any tissue uh, tumor extending ventrally, superiorly and laterally. And so this is an example of a 36-year-old uh, male with a conventional grade three chondrosarcoma I treated several years ago. And you can see in the imaging here, you know, certainly involvement of the petrous portion of the temporal bone, involvement of the mid and low clivus, and also disease extension to the hypoglossal canal and to the longus capitis muscle and the rectus anterior muscle, capitis anterior muscle. And so in this case, I elected to do an endoscopic uh, approach. And what that looks like, you know, there's several sort of key steps to uh, really maximizing exposure, especially when you get out to the jugular foramen and the vertical petrous segment of the carotid artery. And uh, some of the key steps, even to understand from the neurosurgical perspective, is really the, the medial maxillectomy that should be done. And I include this figure uh, from uh, Castelnuovo's group in Italy, and they did a great job in terms of categorizing the different types of medial maxillary windows that can be created depending on where you want to get into the skull base. And for some, for a petroclavial chondrosarc, when you want to get really lateral, uh, the medial maxillectomy that needs to be performed is somewhere between what's illustrated in C and D, where an anterior posterior ethmoidectomy middle turbinate resection, the back half of the inferior turbinate, and the nasal lacrimal duct to some degree skeletonized. And that really allows ultimately lateral and uh, low exposure. The next key step is really dissecting out the, the pterygopalatine fossa contents. Certainly the distal branches of V2, the infraorbital nerve and the descending palatine nerve you want to preserve uh, throughout the dissection. The vascular compartment of the PPF is dissected where the distal branches of IMAX are identified. And I typically uh, clip the sphenopalatine artery. And then working through the posterior periosteal sheath of the PPF, you gain access to the, infra, uh, the infratemporal fossa. And uh, part of the dissection here really focuses on dissecting the inferior head of the uh, lateral pterygoid muscle and detaching it in a subperiosteal fashion from the lateral pterygoid plate. And then ultimately V2 exiting foramen rotundum is identified to really then isolate the uh, medial and lateral pterygoid plates, which then can be resected in their entirety, going anterior to posterior while skeletonizing V2, going back to Meckel's cave and following the vidian uh, all the way back to the carotid artery. And the rationale for doing this for a petroclival uh, lesion is that this really allows you to gently laterally mobilize the contents of the infratemporal fossa so that once you get back to the skull base, you can have access not only to the midline, but all the way out to the peripharyngeal space, the jugular foramen and the lower cranial nerves as they exit the, uh, the jugular foramen. Now, within the skull base, the next steps here really are focused on the carotid artery. And so at this point in the operation, uh, you know, V2 has been skeletonized going all the way back to Meckel's cave. The horizontal, periclival, and cavernous segments of the carotid artery uh, completely skeletonized. Uh, given that there was disease here, I did a mid and low clivectomy. And at this point, basically, I'm uh, resecting bone around frame and lacerum such that you're only left with the fibrocartilaginous tissue along the inferior half of frame and lacerum. And uh, this is then sharply transected. And the rationale for doing this. One is that uh, when you do this maneuver, in addition to resecting the lingual, lingual process uh, superiorly to the ICA, this allows the ICA to be mobilized up superiorly. And then in addition, by transecting this fibrocartilaginous tissue, this really helps with the uh, eustachian tube dissection. Uh, there we go. And so the next steps really are focused on uh, dissecting out the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube. The, Muscular attachments of the eustachian tube uh, are then dissected so that you can skeletonize the uh, cartilaginous portion. And the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube is then sharply transected at its junction with the bony uh, eustachian tube. And of course, when you're doing this maneuver, you want to be uh, cognizant of where the peripharyngeal carotid artery is relative to uh, this cut here. And then once you do that, your access to not only the bony skull base, but any tissue, a tumor extension ventrally into the peripharyngeal space, the longest musculature and the rectus muscle is readily accessible. And all this bone can then be drilled out. And on this image on the right here, you can see the hypoglossal canal skeletonized. The sucker tip is on the medial aspect of the jugular foramen. And, 
and then the disease extending ventrally was all sort of resected. And here are the post-operative scans for that patient. And what you can see on the MRI scan uh, on the top left here is how far laterally you can get with the vertical petrous carotid artery skeletonized here. Now, certainly a key point in the discussion here is really uh, regarding the eustachian tube and the risk of conductive hearing loss after an operation like this. Uh, you know, certainly uh, when you resect the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube, a significant majority of these patients do develop conductive hearing loss that requires a tympanostomy tube. Now, to put that in perspective, uh, for some of the higher grade cancers where they definitely would go on to get radiation therapy, whether you do an open or endoscopic approach, save or, or resect the eustachian tube, they ultimately all go on and develop conductive hearing loss and need a tympanostomy tube anyways. For the lower grade tumors, like a low grade chondrosarc where they don't need radiation therapy, much more thought is put into simply either just mobilizing the eustachian tube or using the contralateral transmaxillary approach that Paul uh, uh, discussed earlier. Now, as I mentioned, there are additional compartments that you need to resect with these petroclavial tumors. So this is an example of a petroclavial chondrosarc with involved in the lateral cavernous sinus. And here, uh, you know, the carotid artery is displaced anteriorly and completely skeletonized. V2 going back to Meckel's cave. And for a case like this, uh, what I do is dural incisions on both sides of the carotid artery so that you have good proximal and distal control and allows you to mobilize it. And then here working within the lateral cavernous sinus with the sixth nerve going into the superior orbital fissure. This is an example of a uh, patient that was referred to me after an endoscopic transclival and an anterior petrosectomy for a large petroclaval chondrosarc. And they had significant subdural disease against the brainstem in addition to disease laterally at the uh, petroclaval junction. And so what I did is I started out here with revision endoscopic approach, uh, adding on a transpterygoid approach. And you know, I include this in terms of highlighting that you can manage subdural disease extension relatively easily. And so the key points here is that with the endoscopic approach, you want good cranial caudal exposure of the vertebrobasilar system so that you're able to identify that arachnoid plane uh, even with a reoperation so that you can sharply dissect the posterior capsule of the tumor off the vertebrobasilar system so that you're left with a view of the entire arterial tree and the brainstem. Now, of course, with an operation like this, you're left with a wide uh, dural defect and especially with these petroclaval resections, they're not midline defects, they extend out laterally towards the jugular foramen. And uh, admittedly, at least in, in my practice, um, I tend not to rely on the intranasal flaps as much because there are often reoperations or extended defects. And so for these cases, I do have a lower threshold to use a regional flap, such as a temporoparietal fascial flap or a pericranial flap. And so in this case here, I did a bicranial incision uh, and you can tunnel that pericranial flap through a slot at the nasofrontal suture. And the, here the video is showing a reconstruction at the end of a transclival left-sided transpterygoid uh, resection. And you can see uh, the pericranial flap is not only e relatively easy to harvest, it's robust and long enough so you can get down to the craniocervical junction. And it's wide enough so you can get out laterally towards the jugular frame and uh, to cover any exposed skull base and dural defect. So as I mentioned earlier, when we looked at our outcomes, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement with petroclival pathology. And when we look uh, with the use of an endoscopic transpterygoid approach, what we find is that using that as the workhorse and then for selective extensions, adding on a uh, lateral skull base approach has significantly improved our resection outcomes and also significantly decreased our neurologic complication rate. And so this really has become sort of one of the workhorses in our toolbox for managing pathology in this area. But you know, as I think the, the point of this uh, seminar, this session is supposed to highlight is that you can't be too dogmatic about when to use a single approach. And so there are particular patterns of either skull base or subdural extension that I look for where I start thinking about doing either a posterior petrosal or combined petrosal approach. And so this is an example of a giant cell tumor uh, that I treated recently. And here, because of the tumor extension lateral to the vertical petrous carotid artery, I felt that this is one that I would not be able to tackle completely endoscopically. And so here, what I did is I combined petrosal with the retrolabyrinthine extension uh, to really resect this tumor. Then there are some higher grade malignancies that involve the petrous apex, but also involve the lateral temporal bone structures. And Fortunately, you don't see that with some of the lower grade tumors, but with high grade osteosarcs and high grade chondrosarcomas, you can see that. This is an example of high grade osteosarcoma involving the, um, the cochlea, the temporomandibular joint, the mandible, and the infratemporal fossa. And so in a case like this, this is an open approach. And so, you know, I did a variation of a fish approach here, but with the preauricular incision, 
where the ear canal sacrificed uh, deep and the pinna is rotated posteriorly and that provides sufficient access to the temporal bone and the entire infratemporal fossa. And here are the views intraoperatively from that total temporal bone resection. Uh, you can see where my pointer is, the facial nerve skeletonized going into the parotid gland. At this point, the infratemporal fossa, the middle uh, fossa, the temporal bone's been resected. Images on the right here show the uh, parapharyngeal vertical petrus. The forceps are on the junction of the vertical petrus and horizontal petrus carotid artery. Uh, hard to sort of appreciate here, but the suture line here is on the eustachian tube, which I closed up at the end. And then the suture line here is on the stylopharyngeal fascia, which is a good sort of fascial barrier to preserve throughout the dissection, just so you can preserve the lower cranial nerves exiting the, uh, the jugular foramen. Now, there are also some patterns of subdural disease extension I look for where I start thinking about doing a combined petrosal. You know, whenever there's a disease extension lateral to the sixth nerve, I think about adding a lateral approach and similar if there's disease extension lateral to the third nerve. But there are also some in-between cases. And so this is an example of a uh, clival chordoma I treated a couple of years ago where there was a small point of origin at the lateral aspect of the mid clivus. And most of the disease was really in the subdural to space you know, with the fifth nerves and the sixth nerve on both sides of the tumor and a little eccentricity towards the left jugular frame and, and uh, with some internal calcification. And so when I was planning for this case, this is a case where I thought that I should be able to achieve it endoscopically and with a transclival approach. And you certainly hope that when you're doing the transclival approach and working in the subdural space that you could hopefully bring that lateral edge of the tumor in into your field if it's a little bit of a softer tumor. And so here I am intraoperatively during that resection uh, at the edges of the field, you see the carotids both skeletonized, a wide clivectomy, a wide dural resection. And at, at this point in the operation, I had uh, cleared disease away from the left vertebral artery, the right vertebral artery, the basilar and all the perforators and was working on this knuckle of tumor along the left lateral edge of the tumor using the sonopet. And um, basically I hit that wall of calcification and whenever I tried to debulk it, the sonopet wasn't touching it. And then I try sort of finding a, uh, a plane of dissection where I could sharply uh, dissect the back end of the tumor in a medial to lateral fashion. But ultimately, the back end of the tumor more medially was all calcified. So after sort of persisting at this for some while, I realized that I wasn't going to move anywhere. So I stopped the operation at this point, did my reconstruction, and then I did a left-sided uh, combined petrosal approach. And so here, uh, the image on the left, you can see the retractor on the petrosal surface of the cerebellum. Uh, lower cranial nerves, the pras probe on the vestibular facial complex, tumor in that interval. Uh, you know, I dissected the porous trigeminus and the facial, uh, the trigeminal nerve all the way out anteriorly, the superior pole of the tumor up against the basilar apex. And then it's hard to appreciate here on the image on the right, um, but basically the tumor completely resected with the uh, ipsilateral vertebral artery in view. And here are the pre and post operative scans. You can see on the left the pre operative scans. And on the right, uh, a complete resection. Uh, this patient did have a partial sixth nerve that got better about three months after surgery. So I included this case, but uh, for the, to, to highlight that while there are cases where you hope to hit the home run endoscopically, knowing that you have the backup of a uh, lateral a combined petrosal approach is helpful so that perhaps you don't push uh, surgery too far, but still hit the home run for the patient. Uh, so to wrap up, in terms of deciding between an endoscopic and a, uh, you know, a posterior petrosal or combined petrosal approach, I think understanding uh, the disease, understanding the goals of surgery are critical. Each tumor has its own particular pattern of extension and relationship to the nerves and the neurovascular structures. For most of the bony tumors in this area, I tend to prefer an endoscopic uh, transterograde approach, recognizing that it comes with the morbidity of a conductive hearing loss. Um, but also recognizing that there's a clear role for the uh, open approaches for particular patterns of tumor extension and subarachnoid extension. And then this figure on the right here I include because, you know, certainly while the radiation therapists and the medical oncologists have a whole toolbox of options to offer patients, you know, it's important that the goals of surgery are still the same and not sacrifice. And I think having the open and endoscopic approaches and being able to combine them can help sort of uh, you know, uh, redefine expectations for surgery for seemingly uh, difficult tumors. So once again, thank you very much for uh, including me in this session.